Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, Obs and Grind Made Easy. In today's channel, I'm going to discuss intrauterine and fetal death. Intrauterine and fetal death can be defined according to the age of viability or the fetal weight. But clinically, we usually use the age of viability. So, what is intrauterine and fetal death? Intrauterine and fetal death is antepartum death occurring beyond the age of viability. In developing countries, the age of viability is 28 weeks gestation age. Whilst in developed countries, it can be 20 weeks gestation age or 22 weeks gestation age. Intrauterine fetal death can also be defined as fetal death weighing more than 500 grams occurring before the onset of labor or during labor. It results in a macerated stillbirth or a fresh stillbirth. A macerated stillbirth is one that has already started going degenerative changes, whilst a fresh stillbirth has not yet started going degenerative changes. A macerated stillbirth usually occurs before labor in the antepartum period, whilst a fresh stillbirth usually occurs during labor in the intrapartum period. Etiology. The causes of intrauterine and fetal death can be classified according to maternal causes, fetal causes, placental causes, or iatrogenic or idiopathic. M maternal causes account about 5-10% to 10 of all the causes. This includes hypertensive disorders like pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, or chronic hypertension, diabetes mellitus as well, infections like malaria, hepatitis, influenza, toxoplasmosis, syphilis, and maternal fevers of more than 39.4 degrees Celsius can cause intrauterine and fetal death. Antiphospholipid syndromes like presence of lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipin antibodies. What these antibodies do is they cause decidual vasculopathy and cause fibrinoid necrosis, which results into a placental vascular atherosis and intervillous thrombosis and cause placental insufficiency, which in turn cause intrauterine and fetal death death. Thrombophilias like factor V laden, protein C and protein S deficiency and hyperhomocystinemia. Abnormal labor such as a prolonged or obstructed labor or even a ruptured uterus can cause intrauterine and fetal death. It can cause a fresh stillbirth because it can cause fetal asphyxia. Postterm pregnancy, we just looked at postterm pregnancy in our previous video, as well as systemic lupus erythematosus. Remember, this is an autoimmune disease. Fetal causes account about 25 to 40% of all the causes and include chromosomal abnormalities, structural abnormalities, abnormalities like an encephaly, a Down syndrome, infections like viral, bacterial, or chorioamnitis. Recess incompatibility can cause intrauterine and fetal death. Non immune hydrops fetalis. Remember, hydrops fetalis, there's excessive fetal accumulation of fluid. Intrauterine growth restriction as well can end up as an IUFD. Placental causes account about 20 to 35 percent of all the causes and include antepartum hemorrhage. Remember, antepartum hemorrhage can be a placenta previa or a brapture placenta. This can cause fetal death by producing acute placental insufficiency. You can have a cord accident, cord accidents like a cord prolapse, a true knot, or a cord around the neck. You can have twin transfusion syndrome or placental insufficiency due to other causes. Iatrogenic causes include external cephalic versions and some drugs that are teratogenic. Idiopathic account for 25 to 35% of all the causes. So what happens when an intrauterine and fetal death occurs? The dead fetus undergoes an aseptic degenerative process called maceration. The epidermis is the first structure to undergo the process where there's blistering and peeling off of the skin. This occurs between 12 to 24 hours of the death. The fetus becomes swollen and looks dusky red. Then there's gradual aseptic autolysis of the ligamentous structure and liquefaction of the brain matter and other organs. So a macerated stillbirth is a death that has occurred more than eight hours before expulsion. Whilst a fresh stillbirth is a death that has occurred less than 8 hours before expulsion. How do you make a diagnosis of intrauterine and fetal death? The patient will come to you with complaints of not perceiving fetal movements. 
And when you examine the patient, the breast changes that occur in pregnancy would be returning back to normal. And on abdominal examination, the height of fundus would have reduced. A previously height of fundus that was about 20 weeks gestation age may now become about 16 weeks gestation age. The uterine tone reduces. When you palpate the uterus, it will feel soft and flaccid, and there will be no fetal movements felt on the examination. And when you listen to the fetal heart using a fetoscope, there will be no fetal heart. And you can confirm this on cardiotocograph or on ultrasound. There will be no fetal heart. And when you examine for the fetal head, there will be an eggshell crackling feel of the head. However, this is a late feature. Investigation. Send the patient for an ultrasound scan. There will be no fetal motion noted, oligohydraminous and collapsed cranial bones. The collapsed cranial bones occur because of liquefaction of the brain matter. You can send the patient for a straight x-ray abdomen, but this is rarely done these days. You will see a spalding sign. Spalding sign is where there is irregular overlapping of the cranial bones. This is because of liquefaction of the brain matter. It usually appears seven days after death. You can also see spalding sign on ultrasound. You can see hyperflexion of the spine and crowding of the ribs, and also Robert's sign. Robert's sign is where there is appearance of a gas shadow in the chambers of the heart and the vessels. Collect blood to estimate the fibrinogen levels and partial thromboplastin time. You can also do a bedside clotting time. This is because there is risk of disseminated intravascular coagulation when a fetus has been retained for more than two weeks. Evaluation of a stillbirth. You have to carry out tests to determine what could have caused the intrauterine fetal death. Some of the blood tests you can do are a full blood count. Full blood count you want to screen for anemia or any signs of infection. You can also do an ABO plus recess incompatibility test. You can also do a KB test. A KB test is a blood test we use to measure the amount of fetal hemoglobin that has been transferred from a fetus to a mother's bloodstream. It's usually performed on recess negative mothers in order to determine the dose you should give of immunoglobin to inhibit the recess antibodies that form in the mother to prevent recess disease in the future pregnancies. You also do a syphilis test. You also screen for diabetes. You do a random blood sugar and a fasting blood sugar, as well as a glycated hemoglobin. You also do a urea and creatinine to assess for renal function in the mother. Also do tests for T3, T4 to screen for thyroid disease. Virus serology, especially for diseases like toxoplasmosis. Lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipid antibodies and also for autoimmune diseases. Send the urine for microscopic culture and sensitivity. Cast cells may indicate a renal disease and past cells indicate this infection. And do a thorough examination of the fetus and the placenta. If there is any malformation, send the fetus for a skeletal x-ray and MRI and weigh the fetus. Assess the umbilical cord for the number of vessels and if there has been any entanglement in the vessels. For the parents, you can do a karyotype to determine if there's any chromosome abnormalities. Assess the placenta if it's meconium stained. If there's any malformation, you should also weigh, you should also weigh the placenta. Autopsy and chromosomal abnormality studies if the fetus has anomalies and dysmorphic features. Complications of intrauterine and fetal death. You have psychological upset infection. It is said that the amniotic cavity is a sterile environment as long as the membranes remain intact. So infection is very unlikely if the membranes are intact. But once the membranes have been ruptured, infection, especially by gas-forming organisms like Clostridium wachi, may occur. The dead tissue favors their growth, which may end up into a sepsis. Blood coagulation disorders are rare. It occurs in 10 to 20% of the cases where a fetus has been retained for more than four weeks. So what happens is that you find the byproducts of the tissue breakdown find their way into the maternal circulation where they trigger disseminated intravascular coagulation. During labor, you can have uterine inertia, a retained placenta, and postpartum hemorrhage. Management of intrauterine fetal death. Prevention is always better. So if you find that there's a patient with history of spontaneous abortions and history of intrauterine fetal death, offer them preconception counseling in their next pregnancy. Do prenatal diagnosis. Do the investigations we've mentioned above and screen the at-risk mothers during antenatal care.
Breaking bad news, it's never easy, but listen to the patient and her family and answer their concerns. Be professional. Conservative management. In about 80% of the cases, spontaneous expulsion occurs within two weeks. You'll do this if there's intact membranes, there's no evidence of sepsis, and no evidence of disseminated intravascular coagulation. You collect bloods for fibrinogen estimation. It should be done twice weekly. If you notice that the fibrinogen levels are going down below the normal value, this should alarm you because it means disseminated intravascular coagulation is setting in. Active management if the patient is upset. The signs of uterine infection and if the fetus has been retained for more than 10 to 14 days and if you've noticed there's a fall in fibrinogen level. The treatment is medical induction with or without oxytocin infusion. Suppression of lactation. You can give them a dopamine agonist like carbagolin or bromocryptin. These are contraindicated in preeclampsia or hypertension. You can also advise the patient to wear a tight bra. Offer them bereavement and family planning counseling. Give them a contraception that they are comfortable using. Of course, in the next pregnancies, offer them preconception counseling. This is the end of our discussion on intrauterine fetal death. In the next video, I'm going to try to discuss abrupt placenta. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos. Thank you.